we made our policy on the South China Sea crystal clear. It's not China's maritime empire. If Beijing violates the international law and free nations do nothing, then history shows that the CCP will simply take more territory. That happened in the last administration. Our statement gives significant support to ASEAN leaders who have declared that the South China Sea disputes must be resolved through international law, not might makes right. What the CCP does to the Chinese people is bad enough, but the free world shouldn't tolerate Beijing's abuses as well. There's a legal term that defines the act of dredging the sea and creating artificial islands which encroach and violate the territorial sovereignty of your neighbors. It's called a violation of international law. Looking at you, China. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rock Logic. I am your host, Sean Kenny, and today we're going to be taking a different turn. In the past few episodes, uh, I've discussed rare earth materials, thorium, and nuclear science, and the ramifications of what you can do when the energy that you produce is too cheap to meter. Uh, this is something that I have a passion for, and when I started this show, I wanted to do it in a way where I could discuss these topics and identify how they fit uh, in a, today's discussion in regards to the economy and uh, geopolitics. I wanted a platform to discuss how to reverse the side effects of three decades of uh, Chinese economic domination so that current and future generations could prosper in a thriving and balanced U.S. economy. I also wanted to express how doing so could lead to a clean energy revolution that would clear a path to a new industrial age. Now, I want to make it clear, I have nothing but respect and admiration for the Chinese people. I cannot say the same thing about the government or the Chinese Communist Party as a whole. But in addition to disgusting human rights violations, crippling Western economies, um, controlling the manufacturing supply chain of critical military hardware, and not enforcing standards and practices to prevent a viral, you know, the spread of viral pandemics, they've also expended resources to force claims onto territories of several nations outside of their economic exclusion zone. Left unchecked could lead to further disruptions in the region. I'm of course talking about the South China Sea, and as of the recording of this episode, there have been several developments in that region that have led to escalated tensions between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China. Now, why is this happening and what led to these developments? To illustrate the issue at hand, I'm going to go back a few years. Now, the South China Sea is a 1.4 million square mile body of water that allows for over $3 trillion uh, of economic trade to occur. Uh, this sits along an economic exclusion zone of six nations, including China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, and the Philippines. In 1947, we had the first instance of what is known as the Chinese Nine Dash Line. It's basically Basically, a self-declared demarcation line that the Chinese government uses to claim the territory for themselves, part of which lies within the territorial waters of the Philippines and Vietnam. It's important to note that China has no legal basis to claim this territory for themselves according to international maritime law. But why make such a bold claim to this territory? In addition to the obvious value of controlling a major economic shipping route uh, where trillions of dollars of global trade occur, uh, the region also has proven reserves of various natural resources. Details obviously vary depending on who you ask, but the best estimates put petroleum reserves at 11 billion barrels of oil and 266 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Now, given the reasons stated, it's pretty clear as to why China wants full control of the sea, but the region also has some strategic value for China. If you're looking at a map of China, uh, you can see that the surrounding waters of the east coast of the mainland uh, borders the Yellow East East and South China Sea. Obstructing China's uh, paths of the Pacific are four nations, including South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and the Philippines, all of which are U.S. allies and would provide strategic support to the U.S. in the event of a war. To counter this, the People's Republic of China has engaged in a series of provocations to its neighbors. This includes the construction of several man-made islands in the shallow reefs of the Paracel and Spratly Islands, as well as the Scarborough Shoals. By basically dredging the ocean and dumping sand into these reefs, they have conducted the largest 
re land reclamation project on record. The Fiery Cross Reef in 2014 was nothing more than a shallow reef which was teeming in aquatic life. Today it is now a military facility comprised of barracks, command outposts, anti-ship missile systems, as well as a massive runway which um, has been told to accommodate pretty much any and all aircraft owned by the People's Liberation Army, Air Force, and Navy. And this is just one of a half a dozen cases of you know artificial lands created and that is now controlled by the Chinese military. On July 12, 2016, uh, an arbitral tribunal under Annex 7 to the 1982 United Nations Convention of the Law of the Seas ruled that China has no legal basis or historic rights within the Nine-Dash nine Line. This is in a case brought by the Philippines. The tribunal judged that there was no evidence that China had historically exercised exclusive control over the waters and resources within the Nine-Dash Line. Now, why do we care? After all, the U.S. has not been actively engaged with China over the territory, aside from some freedom of the seas uh, patrols and operations and an acknowledgement of the UN's position. However, amid growing tensions uh, and a deteriorating diplomatic relationship over recent events, the Trump administration has made it clear that we're no longer re going to remain neutral in regards to Chinese territorial expansion, and the U.S. as a whole is not going to be recognizing the Nine Dash Line. To reinforce these comments, the U.S. has deployed two U.S. naval carrier battle groups in the region and is conducting war games with five allied countries. The People's Liberation Army responded by deploying J-11 fighters and H-6 bomber aircraft to the man-made islands that China controls. They're also conducting war games uh, in the region to project the PLA's capabilities. As of this recording, there have been zero reported engagements that have turned violent, led to an exchange of fire or a loss of life. It's worth mentioning that this is still an ongoing development. Uh, I don't believe this will lead to a war as I don't believe that neither side is really willing to go there. And I really hope that it doesn't because in spite of being the largest military superpower on earth, the U.S. just doesn't have the tools to engage in a military confrontation with China right now. In the previous episode, I discussed how China has a monopoly on the rare earth elements industry. Uh, they control the supply chains, the distribution, as well as the manufacturing of critical components that make the um, equipment that we rely on function. A war with China would end as soon as it began, with the People's Republic of China just placing an embargo on all Chinese manufactured goods. This includes everything from electronics, pharmaceuticals, and medical equipment. Our economy has already endured enough over our reaction to the pandemic. Now, with that being said, do I agree with Donald Trump's decision to challenge China over the South China Sea? Yes, absolutely. But the reason why I'm bringing this topic up is to point out that one wrong move could lead to war. I wouldn't say this about any other country, but in regards to China, they just have way too much control over our industrial supply chains for this to be a fair fight in this exchange. We're not ready. I don't want a war. Hopefully things calm down in the coming week, but... If things continue to deteriorate between the U.S. and China, it could lead to that. Maybe not now, maybe not 10 years from now, but someday it might. And if a fight between the U.S. and China is inevitable, we need to be ready for that. The first thing we need to do is we need to change the game. Now, for those of you who haven't watched the previous episode, I will link it in the description below. I discuss how China has gotten this much power over our manufacturing economy, uh, as well as why our defense industry is reliant on Chinese rare earths. I also discuss the solution and how the Trump administration has been actively engaged in resolving this issue. I end this episode with the hope that when the smoke clears and the dust settles, that we'll be able to move on and deal with these issues at home so that we are better prepared to tackle future issues abroad. Signing off here at home, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Hey, thank you so much for uh, watching today's episode. Uh, we're a new podcast, so we really appreciate if you like this video and subscribe to it. My producer, Jessica, says that I'll get a cookie uh, for every new subscriber we get. Maybe if I'm good enough, she'll let me outside. Is that good? Yeah, all right. Hmm. That's good. That's a good cookie.